It was in the middle of night. My mother yelled outside at night, children, children, get out, get out. A long line of group uh, of soldiers were coming, shooting, burning down our houses, looting our cows, uh, killing anybody they could find. It was total destruction that night. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. John Dow is a beacon of hope and resilience. From his harrowing journey as a Sudanese lost boy to becoming a humanitarian and author. John shares tales of overcoming unimaginable adversity with courage and compassion. Our conversation with John is not just about survival. It's a testament to the power of transformation and making a difference in the world. Join us for an inspiring dialogue filled with insights, laughter, and the indomitable spirit of a true survivor. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. John Dow, by my last count, you were running four charitable foundations and raising millions of dollars for the impoverished people in war-torn Sudan. So thank you so much for making the time to speak with us today. My pleasure, my brother, Tim Green. My brother, you have the most horrific, courageous, inspiring, and ultimately heartwarming stories I've ever heard. I want to talk about that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about your life before this amazing story. What was life like before tragedy struck? What was your family like, your village, your home, your school, your church, your country? Wonderful. Thank you, my real brother, Tim Green. I am so glad and so happy uh, to be talking to you today, to be able to join your podcast uh, today. My life uh, before the war, before the war happened in my village. My life in the village was great. Wonderful. When I was little, when I was a young boy, like other young boys in the village, if you are about age five to age seven, you have a job, you have something to do. For example, you take care of chicken. Uh, I remember taking care of chicken, making sure the bobcats or foxes cannot come and grab them. That was my job at age five to age seven. So I got to listen to the sound of, 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 of chicken making crack, crack, crack. So I got to run there, make sure I protect them. I make sure all my chicken come home safe. Then I put them in their little, little hut. They sleep in there. In the morning, I will open it and then have them go. You know, they go around in the village. I mean, if this is South Sudan right now, village, you know, they, they, the chicken will be around you and, you know, step on your shear and things like that. That was my work. Not only just me, but other boys as well. That's what you do. But when you are, you, you, you sort of grown from age seven to age nine, you transition from taking care of chicken to taking care of goats and sheep. So you go into the jungle in Africa, in the savannah, you know, five, five hours away from your house, your father, your uncle give you some weapon, like a knife, like a stick. And then you go take your cow, I mean, take your goats and sheep to graze. So you protect them from hyenas. 
And then in the mo- later, five hours away, you bring them home safe. You do that with your other boys around in your community, in your village. So g- good from that home, good from the other home there, all together. There could be about 10 boys. There could be about 11 boys. There could be three boys. And then, and then later in the evening, you bring your goats and sheep back home. While you're doing that, as you as, as continue to grow from age 9, maybe to age 15, to age, age 9 to 12, then you transition from taking care of goats and sheep to taking care of cows now. So your duty will be now to protect them from lions, to protect them from leopard or other harmful animal there. That's what we do every single day. You know, bring them in. They are protected. Put them in their home, in their hut. They could sleep. In the morning, you clean it. And then uh, the girls, too, have some job to do. You are at that age. You take care of, uh, you know, other younger kids at home if you are a girl. Um, and as you grow, the girl go to uh, get a firewood, uh, you know, get water. In the United States, we are so blessed to be born in the United States or live in America where you, you, you really don't go and get firewood. You, you turn on, you go to a kitchen and turn on something called stove, turn it on and then the fire, voila, and then you cook, then turn it off. Or you go to a faucet where you can get water, you get water, and, or you go to a, a, a you know, shower room, take care, you take shower, you know, watch yourself and so on. Beautiful to be in the United States. But in our village, you got to have, the girls have to go put water in their head for a distance, a long, maybe about five to eight hours a day, you know, to bring water home, to bring, wow. you know, uh, firewood. And so that's what you do. And while you're doing that as a young girl or a young boy, you have a, a, a older women and older men that help you. They teach you how, what are the community values. You know, they instill in you the community, you know, how to be respectful, how to work harder, and, and, and so on. So that, in a way, was our school. In the United States, schools are buildings where you can, you know, kid come in, and of course you know what I'm talking about, kid come in and then there is one person called a teacher will teach you, and then later they go home. In South Sudan, what we do, our school was in the jungle, was when we, we, we learn as we're doing things. So all of it, whether the school in the United States, the school in, in the village, is the same, we achieve the same thing, teaching kids and how to do things and how to become the leaders of the future of that particular community or particular village. That is how I was brought up. There was no school, like a typical school, formal school. There were no hospital, there were no clinic, there were no nurses, there were nobody. And so we help ourselves. If you get sick, get malaria, your mom and your dad, your uncle, your auntie knows where to find herbs. They could go and dig the roots or get the leaves, dry it, and, 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 and burn it. And then sometimes, you, you know, I mean, they use hutch, they put it in on your wounds and things like that. Those were, that's the, the, these were the situation or how we live in South Sudan. It was just beautiful. Our people going to weddings, they're going to marriages, they're going to ceremonies and, and, and uh, wrestling. And, you know, because we wrestle there. Wrestling is a big sport there. And so a village and another village, they come and wrestle. You know, people come together. We love it. There was no sugar. There was no all those, the modern things, you know. Our life was so good. We are so, so clean in terms of, of, of eating right. You know, we, we grow our food. We do not have big grocery store. Uh, grow our food and then get it and then eat it. In the United States, if you ask a child now, where do you get food? Well, in a grocery store, <laughs> you know, but in <laughs> South Sudan, there were no grocery store. We just plant your food, grow your food, and then all life was good, my brother Tim. In South Sudan, before the war, our life was beautiful. And that's how Don, we learned. When you, were, when you were taking care of the animals, did you ever have to defend them from bobcats or hyenas? Or did you ever many, have personally ever run into anything? Personally, many, many times. For example... Uh, bobcats they are everywhere. They, 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 they love to eat chicken. I mean, the foxes are everywhere. I mean, look, in the villages like this. So in the villages, it's not like in the United States you have, 
you know, place where people group together, live together, closer to each other, like apartments or, or, or big home and so on. I, I, you know, uh, you know, that's not how like that in the skinny Island, for example, I've been to your house. And, uh, so it was it too close to each other. So a house to a house, imagine, uh, in the, uh, in, in the Midwest of the United States, where a house will be far away, like a mile away from each other. And so around it, there's grass, long grass and trees and so on. These are places where these animals, such as bobcats and foxes, hide in it. So you get, so constantly you're there making sure bobcats are not eating them. For example, when goats, hyena love goat, I like eating goat. Many, many times that we chase hyena down because they're trying to sneak in and, and, and grab our, <laughs> our, our, our goats and so on. So we have to chase them in. We have a dog too. You know, so that the dog can smell it far away. Dog can, can can see it before we see it. And then when the dog barking, we go to where the dog is barking, that direction. So maybe yeah. hyena is hiding there. And then when a hyena ha- heard us coming, it took off, they ran away, left it, and, and even lion too. So we got to have to be brave enough to defend your animals. Wow. <laughs> that is intense for... You think you said seven to nine and nine to 12. I mean, that is, that is a lot. <laughs> yeah. I was in, I was playing kickball and in math class. Yeah. I don't, I can't, I can't imagine having to uh, go face animals like that. Wow. Did you play any sports? If not, did you have anything you like to do with any free time you had? Correct. Uh, so Tim, while we at Iowa, they're taking care of our animals. We, we, we play sport. For example, uh, we play uh, a sport called Alouet. Alouet is like a baseball where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a baseball where you have bases. So, for example, all, let, let's say how many kids are there playing Alouet. They go into a, 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 a circle place. That place is safe. Now I will be a lion. You know, and and everyone is human being. And then these human beings will try to trigger me as 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 a lion to be mad. They will say something like, Alouet, Alouet. And then then they, they will yell at me, Alouet, Alouet. And then I will just as a as a lion, I just ignore it. And then they keep saying that word, saying that word, saying, you know, they will say, Hey, hey, what are you doing? You know, in English they say, what are you doing? You are a terrible lion. Look at you. You have four legs. You have seven eyes. You have all of those. They're trying to trigger me as a lion. So when I got it, you know, it got into my skin as a lion. I would say, oh, you know, I would roar and roar at them. And then I would charge at them. I run toward them. When I grab one of them and then I put my hand in that, in, in that person's nose, then now that person became a lion. Now we are two lions. And then we go ahead again, and they will yell at us, and then we'll go to them again, and then I grab them, and then I touch their nose, and then until we, we, we finish them, every, we met everyone to be a lion. You know, whenever the one person that we could not get now become the next lion, and then the game start again. So that's, yeah. that's when we play outside. Or we can play another thing called gurgur. Gurgur is it's, it's a round thing you throw, and then people with a stick, and then you try to fear it. And things like that. Lots and lots of, 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 of uh, sport, the game we play outside there. Were you a good wrestler? Uh, I was not a good wrestler. Uh, my dad was a good wrestler. Uh, I, I am a, a singer. You know, in South Sudan, uh, every man have to, uh, have to compose some, some songs. In the United States, there are those who write songs, there are those who sing songs. That's not how it is in South Sudan. There's no way you can write a song and then somebody else sing somebody else's song. No. In South Sudan, you create your own songs. All right? You compose them. As young as, as I was, I create my own song. For example, one of my songs goes like this. He said, um, uh, you know, uh, I have many of them. Uh, uh, I, I would say, Medajonga Aliebdua, Madinelu, Dirgon Chan Wang Yil Rith Kedan, Hunger Kapil, the Guruo, Kuo Nauk, Anjitonga Winneding Loom, Uchiriwai Dien, Batinga Nila Jetugringalut, Ningman Kinna Wound Dare Oyon, 
Medajonga, Liebdua, Madirilu. So what I mean here is that I am so I am so proud of a big bell of my father. My my father bought a big bell. You gotta have to buy, you know, it's like it's not like this bell we have here in the United States. You see, uh, you know, cows have like a bell cows and things. No, those are smaller ones. They're the teeny, teeny smaller ones. Our big bowl are big, very big. You know, it's like uh, what? It's like uh, two, uh, two uh, pumpkin, big pumpkin together. You know, that is the big bell. So you tie around your cow, your bull neck, and then your bull will just move. And then as it move, the, the bell sound, all right? The bell sound. So here I am trying to promote my father bell, big bell, uh, you know, and 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 and, and I am telling people, look, we have my father have this big bell. I mean, you don't can't even talk to me, my friend. Let me tell you, we have big bell than yours, things like that. So that's what <laughs> my song, that's what, that's what my song mean there. Um, and so, uh, so my father used to. It's a good wrestler, but I. I did not really develop to be a good wrestler. I mean, but I'm a good singer. So people were kids had to choose kind of singing and wrestling or those two different paths. Correct. So for you to, um, uh, you know, attract girls and, uh, to, to be loved by everyone, you know, you either be a good wrestler or a good singer, nothing uh, else. So if you are a good <laughs> wrestler, people talk about you and they, you know, it's like you are famous, you know, if you are a singer too, all of your songs are the ones that are being used to, to dance and people are dancing and so on. Most of the time, you will be on the top pick by girls, you know? <laughs> is that just, John, is that just in your village or is that in, uh, would, would you hear about singers from other villages too? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it goes from, it's, it's just like uh, in the United States. I mean, uh, you know, one village, people will know you and then you're, your, your, your credibility and so on, it, it, it sent a wave. It sent a, a, a wave to the entire other villages and other villages and other villages. And so, like my father was, was a well-built, uh, like your dad. I mean, like, your, <laughs> like Tim. <laughs> I mean, well-built, strong. And so when Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth went there, I think in the, in, in the 1960s, I guess 19, 1956 or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so good, wrestler, good wrestlers and good dancers were collected around the country. My father was actually picked to be one of those. So, so they were there to grace the, the, the coming of Elizabeth. At that time, South Sudan or Sudan was still under British uh, control, uh, British rule. So, yes. Uh, so you are well known for what you do to the community and uh, good wrestler, you represent your village, you represent your region, G good singer, your, your songs are sung by uh, every age, older age, young kids, so everyone in, in between. Did you have any hit songs? No, I did not have any hit song that goes to many villages because I left my village when I was young. So those who have hit songs, the, the, the older one, Assume if I were to be at home from that age to about May into my 20s, yes, I would have a hit song. Uh, but my song were uh, sort of a below of uh, a teenagers. So teenager song really doesn't make, uh, you know, it doesn't go that distant, you know. <laughs> so these are teenagers. So we were regarded as still here. But once you get to be initiated, because I was not initiated when I left home, when you get to be initiated to be a man, then you start singing songs, composing good songs, and then you're going to still now have, hit, you know, that's the way you're going to start to having uh, hit songs and things like that. What was the political status that led to the war that broke out? What was the, the political situation uh, in the village or in the region? Um, so there were these uh, problems that happened in the Northern Sudan, which mean were the seat of the government. And so people in South Sudan felt like they were not, they were not really presented. They were mistreated. They were, um, you know, viewed as like second, uh, second class citizen in their own country. For example, the, anybody in South Sudan in that, at that time 
you know, you were not really allowed to be a uh, a governor, let, uh, you know, not allowed to be a commissioner, let alone being a governor or so on. So those higher positions were not held by South Sudanese. They were all dominated by the Arab in the north, uh, especially also in the police. Uh, if you were if you are lucky to be a South Sudanese in the police post, you could be just only an officer. You will not be, you know, uh, promoted. For those in South Sudan, South Sudan is very big, right? It's it's like a map of Kenya and you, and and Uganda combined, but there was no any single university. There were only three high schools, only three high schools. So imagine uh, the entire state of New York, um, plus you know, plus Connecticut and so on, and 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 you know, maybe the New England, for example, the New England. Assume that you are in the New England, even only three high schools. And then no university. There were butch school, you know, in the other big places, like big cities in Juba, Malakal, and wow, there were butch school under trees, right? But in our villages, there was completely nothing there. So people in South Sudan were not really treated very well. Uh, they were not allowed to hold any position. They were not allowed to protect in the, um, in the running of the country and things that come like development and so on. So they were denied. Uh, all this kind of thing by the the northern elite, and so that caused uh, backlash. I mean, that South Sudanese, those few people who were a little bit uh, enlightened, uh, he knew some, can read a little bit, and so on. Um, they they let the uh, the protest protest here and there, and so so the political wrangling was going on, really going on in South Sudan until it got. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, get to the peak in the 19, uh, 19, 19, 1983. This is when they get into uh, spoil out. I mean, boil out, and people start uh, war. This is when the war started in South Sudan. Looking back, were there any signs at all for what was about to happen? Yes. So, as we're doing all of this, taking care of chickens and goats and cows and so on. No more life, but still, as young kids, you knew there was actually something about to happen, because adults were so depressed, and people talk about in a in a in a in a worry voice. They, they are disgusting things that we the kids really 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 didn't pay attention, or maybe would not understand what was going on. But you can you can feel that it's a tent in the in the in in the village. People are not. Really? easy life was get, get, getting to be uh, something was about to happen were they discussing war or they were discussing protests or just being upset they, or they were discussing how we can save ourselves for example where do we run to i still remember we say okay when if the attack come to our village do we go to the torch or do we go to the east torch mean it to the nile to the river nile Touch. This is where we take our cow in during summertime. So we call it touch. T O C H. Do we go to touch or do we go to the east? To the wow. so others will say we go to the east. We're gonna die of thirst. There will be no water there. Uh, others will saying if we go to the touch too. It's gonna be water. It's gonna be swampy. It's gonna be there will be no uh, uh, like a you know a, 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 a ground where we can live. I mean, there will be nothing there or along the Nile. So Nile overflow, it creates something called SUD, S-U-D, S-U-D-D. It created that SUD around, around it. And that is a Swami, the largest wetland in Africa. So it's called Toj. So there is, there is no way you can live. You know, it's all, there, there are no islands there. So people were arguing, well, we're d- discussing. They, we go to the Toj, it's okay to go to the toilet because if we don't have something to eat, we can live on fish. While others said, if we go to the east, that there'll be no water and so on. And if we don't have cows and goats and so on, we're going to starve to death. Those, those were common discussions that people were discussing. Could you please tell everyone what happens next and what would have happened to you if you had stayed? So, yes, as we have been... Uh, experience this, experiencing this uh, feeling of uneasiness. People are not, something was about to happen in the village. 
and people discussing where to go. If we are attacked, where do we run to? Where do we hide? What do we do? Uh, what do you do as a child? So as we were thinking about that, and, and, and this actually dominate the discussion in the community, in the villages, uh, one of the nights uh, where my brothers and I, we were sleeping in our own little hut. It was in the middle of night. My mother yelled outside at night, thing in the middle of night, my mother was saying, meet, meet Bagbe. She, she was saying, children, children, get out. That is, meet, meet Bagbe. That's a Dinka statement saying, children, children, get out, get out. So as we heard my mother, you know, boys outside, and then the bombardment explode here and there, the whistling of bullet, we woke up quickly. And then out, I think I was the first to get out of my, my, my hut. And, and then when I got out, I ran across my home compound and, and, and I saw somebody running, running. And I thought that is my father. This is in the total darkness. The, the, the whistle of a bullet, the, the bombardment explode here. You can, you can see fire here, fire there and so on. It was, we were now, I was now uh, clear that we were under attack. So the guy that I was thought was my father I was running after him for a few, few uh, minutes later, that person dashed into the grass. And when I was coming by, he grabbed my right arm and pulled me into the grass. A long line of group uh, of soldiers were coming, shooting, burning down our houses, looting our cows, uh, killing anybody they could find. It was total destruction that night. You could see fire here. That home is, is engulfed in fire. Another one there, another one there. The, 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 the sound of guns, the, the, the bombardments, and people yelling, and people crying, and so on. It was completely a huge destructions. And that's why I said it was as if God got tired of us that night. The guy that I thought was my father, that guy turned out to be my neighbor, you know, uh, Abraham. Abraham and I were sheltering there in the, this long grass and all the activities of shooting and so on. So we just ducking there. We stayed there for a few, uh, few hours and then about uh, five in the morning, then we took off ran away, ran away as fast as we could. You can see, and you look back, all the villages that I could see, <clears throat> you can see smoke there, smoke there, all houses burning down. So we kept running, kept running until the, uh, until the evening. As we kept going, we went there <coughs> and um, hide in long grasses there, get, 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 you know, get, get, get rest a little bit, then we kept going. Abraham and I we kept running for two days doing that. Uh, I was so hungry. My, my tummy, I mean, I, I just didn't feel myself. My, my, my feet, you know, were so tired. And, and, and the element cutting our feet and so on, it was terrible. Uh, thinking about my mom, uh, thinking about my, my dad, uh, thinking about my brothers and, and sisters, that was something, whether they were killed, they're still alive. And what happened? And where am I going? All these things raising in my mind. We went for two days with no food. After that, later Abraham dug a, um, a plan, a root of a plan called Amuro out. We ate it. It tastes like apple. That was our first food after two days. You know, in the United States, you go for a day without food. You say you're going to die. We didn't die. We kept going. <laughs> As we're moving, uh, uh, and, and so days and after days, what we have done was to look for uh, uh, a night. We Sometimes we travel a night um, or we travel daytime. A night was so cold. I remember we sleep next to each other. So we get warm, uh, you, know, you know, sort of sleeping next to each other tight because there was no blanket to cover ourselves so that we can at least get some warm as well. Uh, at daytime, we could look for something to eat we go to homes that were uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, we go there and find some beans, or find some pumpkins, and, 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 and whatever that we can find, we can eat. Then we grab, we, we take it, and then cook it in a deep, deep forest so they cannot see our smoke. Um, looking for water, we listen at night where the sound of frogs were making noise, crack, crack, crack. Then we know this direction, there may be water there. Then we can get water. Or we could see birds circling around. Either something is dead there 
or uh, there's water there. This is that's the technique technique we develop as we moving, uh, uh, you know, by ourselves. So there were Abraham and I, two of us. Later we were five, two, one woman and her two daughters, and two of us were five. Later, this woman and her two daughters were abducted uh, by the by the militia. They were taken to becoming their wife. And so we kept going. Uh, later, hey John, John, when they abducted them, did they not see you guys, or why they they only? Took- oh, we, we 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 saw them, and then we ran and hide because we knew they will kill the men first. And these yeah. women didn't, you know, maybe they think they would not be killed, uh, but they didn't kill them. They abducted them. But we, Abraham and I, we, we, we went into the long grass and, and hide. You know, we, we saw them far away. We knew these are, because they were coming in a long, a long line. So we knew that these are militias and so on. So we went and dashed out and, and, and hide. But uh, this woman and her two daughters were then abducted, remained two of us. Later, uh, by this time, we were about a month and a half from, from a home. Uh, the problem of hunger became really a big problem. Uh, with, for example, we can we don't find anything like uh, beans or, or what about pumpkins or some kind of things. We, it, it, the situation reduced us to shoe uh, like a maize stock or 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 sagam stock. You shoe it, it, you know, you you swallow some sweet juice. Um, so so the re- situation reduces us to shoeing grass like cows, you know, or we can uh, look for grass offers because around, it's around, around November, grass offers and kill them and then pierce uh, a stick onto a grass offer and then roast it over a fire like the way killed children do the marshmallow here and roast it, roast it, roast it and then you eat it. That help you. And then you drink water, then you're strong. Then keep going. Uh, we By this time now, we're uh, two, two months in our uh, journey. Now, it's very clear we are going toward Ethiopia because the, 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 the South Sudanese rebels that are fighting the North, the Northern Sudan that attack our village, they, they went to Ethiopia. And so the word said, that is a place where you have relative uh, peace. So we kept going. Now, we came to a place called uh, Konkong. This area was inhabited by the, the tribe called Murle. Murle were so hostile. They they collaborate with the government. And so anybody they could find, they'll kill them. So what we did was going around their villages, we walk at night. Daytime, we went into the forest, you know, you know, sleep or whatever it is, stay there. Day, uh, day uh, it is nighttime, we resume, kept going. This put us into a position where there was, uh, put us where, they, where there's no water. So we came to this place called Kong Kong. We thought there was water. We went for one day and a half with no water. We've never been drinking. Now, two days, people are crying. Uh, desperation set in. We were 27 by this time now, 27 of us. D- desperation set in. People are crying. For example, you will have to have somebody else urinate so you can drink urine. That didn't even help. So a life became difficult. Now we knew that this is the end of it. And now you are on your own. So we kept going, others said, no, let me just die here. They remain there. And then we will keep going. We kept going. We're 27. By the time we find muddy water, they're like real muddy water. Uh, we just scoop it with our hand and then eat it. It's <laughs> mud. Uh, by the time we get, get into this muddy water, only four of us survive. Wow. Twin, we were 27, 23, completely dead. So our life was there. It became very difficult. And, uh, you know, as we're moving there, only four of us, we, we passed through that community called Murle. So we came to a community uh, called Anyuak. Now we are about to get into Ethiopia. About to get into Ethiopia. We went to Anyuak area. Anyuak were very good people. They did not give us anything, but they could not, you know, harm us. One day we found out that they have killed an elephant. Uh, so we went there. We found them, they are cutting elephant meat into pieces. So we went there and asked them if they could give us some uh, piece of meat, piece of elephant meat. And, uh, and as we've been doing that, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> so, so this one of, one of the younger guys there chases us away. 
Uh, and then we ran away for a few uh, few uh, meters away. Then we stand there. I think one of the older one of all, all the men uh, fell fatty on us, and they said, "Come back, come back!" You know. And we came back. They gave us a big chunk of elephant meat, and then we cook it and cook it and cook it for hours. Elephant meat cannot cook quickly. Cook it and cook it for hours uh, because we did not have a knife. So we got a, I got out of this big chunk of elephant meat like this. I put it in my mouth and tear it using my teeth and give it to that person and then tear it, give it to the other guy and then tear it, give it to the other guy until we got enough uh, of elephant meat. It was delicious. That was our best food ever since we left home, uh, you know, three three months later. Uh, and then we kept some part of it as we're going through a new act. And then eventually we cross into, in, into Ethiopia, now different different country. Now we became refugees. John, when, when you guys were traveling for your two months, when, when you'd pick, when you'd get more people, you would just see other people who were also running and you would say, let's all come together? That's correct. So we, we merged along the way. Other villages were also attacked, not only just my village. So other villages were attacked. Maybe for four months ago or many months ago or something like that. And then we joined ourselves. Now it became clear going to Ethiopia was good, was a, where there is a place of relative peace there. And so, so people were going to Ethiopia. Got it. So everybody was kind of heading in the same direction. Correct. Correct. Got it. Man, that must have been so crazy seeing other people because you didn't know if you should... Did you know when you saw people if you should hide from them or talk to them? Like, could you tell? Correct. That's correct. So we you can tell. Sometimes we run away. They can run away from us, or we can we can <laughs> run away from them. And then till we found out, actually, we we were the bird of the feathers, you know. So we are <laughs> the same people. So they will come back again. Uh, Sometimes people run away and they never come back again. You know, um, yeah. they may think suspect you to be to be malicious, and so. Sure. So they can they can go and high and and so on. And why do you think the people in that in that village that gave you the elephant meat does that village were they kind of neutral or why do you think that they were willing to help you while kind of other villages were trying to kill you? You know, I don't know why. I think maybe because they're so sort of at the border, and and so they were not collaborating with the government. You know, I, I think there are some element from their home also joined the rebel. Uh, and and so and so they were f- rebel friendly, you yeah. know, which means they were South Sudanese rebel friendly. Whereas the other group, uh, the Murile, were not. They were collaborating with the government. So government was using them as part of what we call counter insurgency. So they they they, they were using this community uh, that cooperating with them uh, to c- encounter South Sudanese rebellion, this Christian rebellion. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe the story. I've heard the story before, John. Every time I hear it, I can't believe it. It's so <laughs> crazy to me. What happened next, John? I want you to take us up to the point where you cross the river. Correct. So <clears throat> now we, we cross into Ethiopia. Uh, four of us, we cross into Ethiopia. Uh, we went deep a little bit into Ethiopia. And then the, the, the government of Ethiopia in a place called Pinidu, uh, they show us, they said, okay, refugees. So there were those who came before us. And so as we are coming, so, the, 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 so we were converging into this area that known as the, the, the Kakuma, I mean, not Kakuma, the uh, Pinidu refugee camp. Mm-hmm. Now, the people here, the Ethiopian show us and say, hey, you see that jungle? Yes, that is your home. Go live there. So we were pointed to a jungle. So we went there and lived there. So we live under a tree for a while. The trees were our house, <laughs> houses. And then we lived there and sleep there and so on. And then, so the number of boys and girls and some adults became many, uh, 10, uh, 20, or 100, or whatever, four. And then we all converge here. Our numbers swell, becoming big. Now, John, because- when you made it, when, when you got to Ethiopia, oh, Ethiopia, were you like, Oh, we made it. We finally made it. Like, was it like celebration or were you still nervous? You didn't know what was going to happen. Still nervous. We did not know what will happen. Uh, so we, we, there was no like, uh, 
feeling feeling relief. There was no relief there because these people we did not know how different they are from the other people that we went through. So we were so kind of nervous too. So we just do do it by year. Uh, we just live Got there. It. So then they so we came as together because we lost families. So we create our own families, a family of fifty people. Fifty people as a family. Fifty people as a family. I was twelve. But I was taller than the other boys, so I was picked to become a leader of one group. Uh, as I was with, you know, with this group, then the number of boys were added into our group, and our group became about 1,200 boys. Wow. Uh, their age were from age 5 to age 15. These kind of many, many children there in one place, they're crying every day. They want to uh, eat food. They want to drink milk. There is nothing I and other older boys could do. We lie to them. Hey, guys, today's bad. Tomorrow is going to be good. We t- we're trying to give them some sort of uh, some sort of uh, hope so they can hope for tomorrow, you know, can hope for something that it's going to, you know. And as as we stay there, as a number getting bigger and bigger and bigger, disease such as cholera, typhoid, whooping cough, measles, we're killing boys every day. In our group, I remember two or three boys dying every day, every single day, two or three. Wow. We could take their bodies, we could bury them in a place, uh, you know, deep, shallow grave. And, and, and that grave, uh, you know, we bury them. You, can, you come back the next day to bury the bodies of some more boys. You could find the bodies of those who buried previous day eaten by wild animals such as hyenas. It was very graphic. Uh, wow. seeing these people being mules there. But we live there. They, then they start bringing food there. The United Nations, the World Food Program, the other groups start coming and uh, giving us food. And uh, in, it's getting better. Life was getting better there in Ethiopia, in that uh, refugee camp. And even they start giving us clothes, you know, secondhand clothes. Remember, Troy, when when you, you're growing up, I mean, you see, you know, you right, you, you you know, some clothes don't, don't fit you anymore. Your mom and dad take you to uh, donate them to Goodwill or somewhere. Those clothes make their way to the refugee camp. For uh, in our case, they were bringing these big bags of clothes, and then they will give maybe, for example, uh, ten bags of clothes to 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 one group. But they're, they're not enough. So what do you do? Is there will be people you put your hand in it. Your hand will be put into it, and then pick what you can pull out. Is that your clothes? I remember when it became my turn to put my hand into one of the bags. Uh, they don't allow it to look through it. It's just your hand in it. So I went in there. I pull a, a white clothes. I think I belong to a girl because they have some decoration around it here. You can meet, you can pull <laughs> the elastic there. And so that was beautiful. I love my 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 first shirt uh, there, wow. uh, and then I I wear it so so proudly, <laughs> you know. And so that's how. So you get one. That's it. Somebody else put his hand to pull something. Only one. And then whatever it is, if it is a shirt, that's it. If it is a shirt, like I did, that's it. If it is what? If it is a blanket, okay. Then they start giving us some blanket. Uh, the quill. Remember the, uh, the, the I don't know whether you guys have seen quill. This spotted uh, blanket, you know, have mm-hmm. some layers in it, uh, sure. and so they're giving us big, uh, give you a big blanket. Then we rip, rip it, and then put part of uh, you know, sew part of it as your underwear, and 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 you you know, you use part of it, cover yourself. Four years there in Ethiopia, our life was getting better, and they they built a very small clinic. We stay there in Ethiopia for years. Then, or unfortunately, the government of Ethiopia, which was good to us, was quickly overthrown by the Sudanese, by the, by, by the Ethiopian rebel based in northern Sudan. So, so the Ethiopian rebel are allied with the northern Sudanese. We, the southern Sudanese, were allied of the government of Ethiopia. Right. Then government of Ethiopia was overthrown. And our, our ally was quickly overthrown. And then we were asked to go back to South Sudan. Now, the number of the lost boy, the lost girl, and some, some adult, we became 27,000 of us. As we're trying to move back to South Sudan, there were no buses to shuttle us out of that area. There was nothing. So we have to go back to South Sudan. And then now we have, we have encountered another problem, crossing rivers. 
in, and John, in, in, before, in that area. Before you, get to, before you get to the river, when they, how did they tell everybody? Did they get everybody together and say, hey, everybody, it's time to leave? And then what did okay. you feel? What did you think when they said that? Yeah, so it was organized. Remember, there was a leader of a group. So we're from group one to group 13. Mm -hmm. these, these, these are young boys only. And then there were these community. And then there is also somebody in charge of the entire camp. So that person had to disseminate uh, the messages to go to Gosh. the leaders of group, to go to the leaders of community. And then the day was uh, scheduled, day to leave. And so we have to, so you carry whatever you can carry in your neck uh, and so on, on your head and, 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 and the, you know, some clothes are, you know, given to you, blanket and so on. So we got to move back to South Sudan. Now we came and stopped at a place called Gilo. Gilo is a river. You watch National Geographic Channel where you can see animal crossing rivers in Africa and then uh, crocodile grab them. That was what was about to happen to us. So we stay there trying to find a way to cross this river. And we did not know how to cross it because some of us did not know how to swim, including myself. And uh, one of the day, three days there, one of the day, the rebel that overtook the government of Ethiopia, which is actually the current government today, uh, they sent troop after us. Around 3 p.m., they opened fire on us killing some of the boys, others dive into the water, eaten by crocodiles, others drowned, others lost, others shot and killed, others uh, captured. It was terrible. For myself, I didn't have any, any other way. I just dive into the water. But somehow the Lord, God, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, gave me an idea. Then I start doing the back stoking. I did not know. I'd never swim before. I did the back stoking like this. <laughs> and then I kept, and then I was progressing. I was crossing the river. Then there are these Nubian boy. A Nubian boy say, Sadiana, Sadiana. That's an Arabic word of saying, help me, help me. So this guy, he jumped from, <laughs> in a jump on to me. And we all went under the water. And I, I thought, this is it. I'm just... <laughs> You know, somehow we were struggling coming back and they got back onto, uh, onto water surface there. And then again, they went underwater. So we keep doing this. We keep doing this, going down and come back, going down. And, come back. and I, I was just crying too. I mean, I said, this is it. I'm dead and all of those. Somehow we crossed the river. I, you know, but the boy, the guy, I don't know what happened. So, you know, I got free of, of, of him. And, uh, you know, I don't know what happened to him until today, but I got out and disappeared into the, into the long grasses and other boys as well. So by the time we got back to the place that were given elephant meat, now we went back to that place called Pochala. Only 12,000 of us got there. Some shot and killed, some drowned, some eaten by crocodile, some captured, and some get lost. So you went from you went from twenty seven thousand thousand to twelve to twelve thousand. So fifteen thousand people died crossing that river. Others died. Some captured. Others lost. Whatever happened to them? Wow. Uh, the, the soldiers captured many of them, and so on. Don't know who actually how many actually died there, perished there. There could be but thousands only 12, as well. Thousand made it through. Yeah, wow. Right. Only only twelve thousand made it through. So we went, we came back to the that community that we got to end up and meet, and then we stayed there for nine months, and then hunger. There's no food. Then we start selling our clothes. Remember my white clothes and so on. We start selling them for food. We start selling our uh, blanket for food, and then we all remain naked. No, no, no clothes on us. Uh, we being bummed every day by the government of Sudan, um, bomb us in the morning, in the afternoon, using Russian met aircraft known as Antonov. Antonov, even right now, if I hear the sound of Antonov, I can tell you, you know, we knew, we sort of, <laughs> sort of used to that. Uh, so we decided to move to the interior part of South Sudan. So we, we went in, went back, not to our villages, but we went to another place called Kapoita. From that place, Pochala, the, the, the place we got the elephant meat, 
to the new place took us about six months to get there on bar on, on foot. Some died along the way of thirst, disease, hunger, killed by uh, wild animals, and so on. It's like uh, it's like when you see a school of fish in the ocean, where the shark go and grab some, where some bird above dive in. That was our number, our number reducing and reducing, reducing, get smaller and smaller. So we can get, we eventually get to that place called Kapoita. We stayed there three months. We were then attacked. We went to another place called Nairus. We stay about a few months there. Then we were attacked. 1992, uh, I think November 1992, around that time, we then crossed into another country called Kenya. Now, how many, John, ahead. how many, how many people roughly are there at this point? At this point, I think we were about uh, maybe 10,000, uh, okay. the boys, maybe about 10,000. Maybe we lost two or something like that. Uh, so we got there, and then there was some doll came as well. So we went to a, we were taken to a desert place called Kokuma refugee camp. There was no, it was not called refugee camp. So we were taken to this, you know, desert place. At night, it was so dusty and so on. So we said, uh, they were told, they were, we were told that this is your home now, your new home. Then we start making it happen. The Lord actually been with us. And then that place was so dusty and so on. Then rain started raining. Never happened before. <laughs> you know, never happened before. Even the, the, the native were not happy with us because they didn't build anything because they live in a desert. And so when the rain started raining, in, because we came there, I, I do think, and then they didn't like us there. They said, we brought rain to them. Anyway, so we stayed there. Uh, Kenya was good. This is when, I, by this time, I was 12, uh, 17 years now. And then they, we started school. Our school under trees, sitting on the dirt, using our fingers as pencil to write our uh, exams, and do, write our homework, do all of those kind of things. We were very happy. We were getting education. This is where I started to learn A, B, C, D, one, two, three. Never been to any school of any kind before I was 17. And then stayed there, um, you know, and, um, and, and, and so our camp was getting bigger and bigger. There were many people coming. And uh, in the year 2000, when I finished my high school, we were told that Americans are here. They're going to take you to the United States. And, and now it became a topic in the camp. Well, we didn't really believe them. And that America, we're going to go to America. Well, no. Anyway, so so people are talking about about America, about America. now. They, some these, these uh, you know Americans coming first time to see an American guys long noses. You know they were talking like they're speaking through their noses. Their English was completely <laughs> difficult to understand. And what they were telling us, they would take us to America. America is a nice place, and so on. And now the entire camp talking about America. For example, the, one of them would say. You know, John, if you go to America, it's okay to be lazy in America. Because if you are lazy in America, the American people will tie something called green card around your neck. And you just show up at any restaurant, and the owner of the restaurant says, hey, you are, a, you are a refugee, come and eat for free. I said, wow, it's a place I would like to go, you know. <laughs> While they were saying, you know, if you go to America later, John, they are better good technology. You go to any restaurant in America, you don't need somebody to serve you. All what you get is the big tables. You go there and sit in front of one of those tables, and there is some button on the top. There's chicken button, there's beef button, there's vegetable button. So you, you want to eat chicken, you just press chicken button, and chicken coming rolling from nowhere. I say, wow, okay, nice place, you know? While others will say, you know, John, be careful when you go to America, because American girls are crazy. They, they said, how crazy American girls are. They said, every girl in America, John, they carry small bag. And they said, do you know what is in those bags? I said, no. They said, they have guns in it. If you mess up with an American girl, they shoot and kill you. you know? And I said, this is a country where, where you have chicken button and women are killing people. What am I going to do? You know? I said, you know, okay. Well, well, later my name came out of the water and said, John, you're going to Syracuse, New York. Ah, okay. I said, you know what? I'll go to America. If it is because of girl, I stay away from American girl. <laughs> All of a sudden, we have flown to Europe and then to JFK, and then to Syracuse. Now there are people from our church in Skinny Ellis there. There are Susan Myers, there is Penny Allen, there were some others as well, 14 of them. 
All right. They went to Syracuse uh, uh, airport. And now we got out. So Jacob, Andrew, and myself. So we, as we merge out of the corridor there at the airport at Syracuse there, I think they, they ran up to me and said, welcome, welcome. to." I think they knew who came from Africa, very skinny and, and dark skin. Said this guy came from Africa, exactly. So we, uh, I mean, they ran after us and they, they very nice people. They hug us and we hugged them too. They were very, very nice, 14 of them. But there were four girls there. I didn't, I didn't want to hug those girls. I thought I would mess them up and shoot and kill them. So I stayed away from them. <laughs> anyway, later yeah. they took us. They took Did us they have to their, our, they had their bags with them. They had their first? bag in yeah. there, so that what I, I I have to see that first. So I didn't want to go go to them, and uh, maybe I may do something wrong and shouldn't kill me. So we went there. They took us to our apartment. Uh, if you go to Syracuse, there there is a place called Grand Village near Sharp City, uh, near Sharp City area there. So there is a big apartment there called Grand Village. They took us to our apartment, uh, uh, Grand Village there. And then they show us how to do things, how to turn off light. This is how you twist light. This is how you push light. This is how you use a refrigerator. This is what kind of food you put in the refrigerator. This is what kind of, this is how you take shower. They took them the entire day uh, to, uh, to give us orientation before they go back to, ch- before they go back to church, uh, go back to screen and they say, you know, John, let us take you to show you how to buy groceries. Okay, I said, okay, let's go. So there were these big grocery store there. I think it's now called Peter. Uh, it used to be called Peter now. PNC now, I think maybe name changed, but it's that big grocery store there, a shop city yeah. area. So we went there. It was closer to us. So we went there and coming and coming closer to this big uh, store. And maybe, you know, as we got it was closer, come closer to the door and a magic door opened itself like this. Ah, oh, I, I said, oh, that's, I was so amazed. I said, yeah, I said to myself, truly the American people are very lazy and that's why they don't want to pull or push the door. You know? But I didn't want to tell them. I thought if they hear that, they would be mad and should have killed me. So we went inside, <laughs> went inside this grocery store, my friend. It's just uh, lots of food. We, you know, we came up on aisle of this food, aisle of that food. And I said, this country is so wealthy. Even our, even, even animal, like there's aisle dog aisles and cat aisles. Wow. I said, <laughs> wow, that's a country so wealthy, even animal own aisles, you know? So anyway, so we went around it. We went to this uh, big, uh, uh, went to this big uh, um, refrigerator. You know, I looked some, I saw something like, uh, like a milk. And I asked Susan, Susan, is that milk? And she said, yes. I said, is that from a cow? And she said, yo, yeah, that's from a cow. Uh, I said, okay. So we went in there. I opened it. Then I grabbed two gallons of milk, put it in the tray. Jacob grabbed two gallons of milk, put it in the tray. Andrew grabbed two gallons of milk, six <laughs> of them. And, 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 and so these women are, uh, you know, just looking at each other. And they said, boy, so um, is this what you, you want? Uh, we said, yeah. You want to buy all six gallons of milk? We said, yeah. And they look at each other, you know, in America here, people don't want to embarrass you. So they look at each other and they go, oh, okay, okay, we can go. So we went there, check our milk out and put it in our car, went, went to our apartment, could not really wait for this American to go home, go back to skinny hours, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so we could start drinking our milk. I got to tell you, they went and said, hey, boys, we're going to come on Sunday to pick you up, take you to church. Okay, good. Close the door, bind them. And they went and they would start drinking. I got to tell you, man, we've been drinking this milk for a week. No food. We've been drinking milk for a week. And the reason is because we are cattle keepers. We've never been drinking milk since 1987, you know, until, yeah. <laughs> until 2001, uh, where we can find milk. You know, anyway, so, and, and then they take us to our church. They take turn, uh, take us to our church in the Skinny Alice. One day they say, hey, you know, snow is coming. Please help. That was no. That was around October. Snow is coming. Please help South Sudanese. Uh, help the boys. And then people have been buying all this ugly stuff like gloves and hats and boots and all of the coats and all of those. And and so they've been given. So then, and then there was uh, uh, there was uh, you know uh, snow at East Syracuse around Syracuse University. You know around Syracuse University there. So. 
uh, Cindy from our church and say, John, I'm going to take you to see snow for the first time. I say, yeah, let's go. Went there. Um, and it was something white, you know. I just grabbed a bunch of snow. That was my first time. It turned into, the wa- it turned into water. So she grabbed a bunch of snowball and threw it at me. So I did the same thing too. I threw it at her. We were changing snowball for a few minutes. I felt my hand is numb. I said, you know what? We've got to go. i gotta, gotta got to go back. Uh, <laughs> and she said, okay, okay. So what I did was I grabbed a, a bunch of snowballs, you know, put it big, big snow like this, and put it in the trunk of her car. And then we drove to our apartment. And then in, in lucky enough, the snow was still intact. I said, Andrew and Jacob, come and look at snow. And we look at it. Well, we decided we took it inside our apartment, put it on a dining table, and then start melting a few minutes later. You know, <laughs> that was a very stupid thing to do. But and that was the introduction to American crazy weather and so on. Anyway, three months finish, uh, Troy and Tim. Three months finish. Uh, then we were told that you are now on your own. Uh, and then I start, uh, uh, start my first job at McDonald's. There, there is this McDonald's uh, around northern North, uh, Syracuse there. Uh, that was my first uh, job, doing dishes at McDonald's, grill hamburgers at McDonald's, and, and, and so on. We were working hard. Um, we didn't have even, uh, you know, driver license. But there's nothing we can do. We can uh, we ask people from our church to help. Sometimes they help, uh, but we just have to work hard. Two jobs. Sometimes only sleeping for two hours, three hours. What did you think when you knew that you were coming to America? What preconceived notions did you have? What I have was uh, okay. So I was see. I've been going to a known place all the time from home, being shoot out, and then ran away almost being killed, and went to unknown, unknown, into the jungle, unknown, into Ethi- into other villages, unknown places, till Ethiopia, back from Ethiopia, into, back into the unknown. So I'm, I was used to the unknown. So I said, okay, going to America, is, it's going to be like going to Ethiopia, going to be like going to Kenya. So, so but in a way, it was like going uh, onto the moon, because you don't know anybody there. So I didn't know anybody in the United States. So, but I just take it by faith. I said, okay, I'm going to go anyway. Maybe I'm going to make it. Maybe I'm not going to make it. So I was so nervous too, even flying too. I mean, flying, coming to the United States. too was uh, another very scary one. Uh, but coming to America, I did not know whether we will be treated well, whether people will actually love us, you know, and so on. We're going to find nice people like Tim Green, uh, your family. And so so we did not know what we were going. So we were going into the unknown. So I'm used to the uh, going into the unknown. And, and so it became part of my life. And that's why when I start doing something, I just said, okay, this is another unknown. I can do it too. Did this country live up to your expectations? Um. Uh, it, it, yes, it, 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 it did, and, and it does. Uh, America live up to my expectation, actually exceeded my expectation. My expectation when I was coming here, I did not know whether I would be treated nice. I did not know that I'm going to have good friends. I did not know how, whether life would be better. Uh, but it has uh, surpassed my, uh, my expectation. Uh, America has been a sanctuary for people that are being mistreated, a sanctuary for people that can come to heal, a sanctuary for people that, uh, that they will have another chance, second chance to be called home. America has been a huge sanctuary for not only just myself, but for all the other people, refugees or, or migrants that, that come here and their goals or dream are realized. For example, by myself, <laughs> I have done not only that, been to school, went to universities in America, treated like any other person here, or uh, benefited from American system, from American laws, from American regulation, from American uh, uh, goodness. Uh, I benefited from that. So that's huge, huge. Uh, 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 you know, uh, benefit that I have been. So my expectation 
of what America would have been when I when I thought about it, it it turned out to be even greater than what a human being can think. Do you ever have nightmares about that river crossing? I still have nightmare until today, very much uh, dealing with lions, very much more, uh, some of the time I just have to fight with lion here <laughs> in my dream and uh, crossing that river as well, trying to survive, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to save myself from drown and so on. But these, had ne- they have never becoming my stumbling blocks they become a sort of motivation and reminder. They remind me, if I get into, get into lost into American goodness, abundance in the United States, uh, easy life in America. I mean, for those who are going to hear me, I'm not naive, <laughs> you know. I'm not saying America is that, it's, it's like, a, you know, it's, there's no silver bullet here. Oh, there's no uh, silver spoon here. But there is huge, lots of opportunities that you can create your own silver spoon in America. If you work hard, uh, respect the laws, uh, 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 have appreciation in your heart. So little thing you get, you appreciate. Appreciate whoever giving it to you and also appreciate the system, the, uh, the, the, the American uh, 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 you know, values and so on. Uh, you know, you, 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 you will live very well, uh, in this country. And actually you will heal, Bune, uh, what you were, were not thinking. I mean, what you were not expecting here in this country. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I am, well, whatever I was, you know, it has completely surpassed my expectation in this country. Except for the chicken button. We got to work on that still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to have to, I'm be looking for it. Where can I get chicken button? Uh, all, all, all of it. There are something resembling it now. You can go to uh, something called drive through. Uh, I yeah. think drive through for the first time I went through that drive, uh, you know, somebody took me and said, hey, John, let's go there. And it actually turned out to be McDonald's at that time. I did not know. So we went through, went to drive through. So you can order something and then get it without, get out of your car. I mean, maybe if you are an American born here, you really may not really get what I'm talking about, you know, easy thing in America. Yeah. So that is sign of resembling chicken button. <laughs> I know that you, like me, are, are a devout Christian. How important was your faith in the various challenges you have had to face? Pe- people ask me, uh, how did you survive? I say two things. One, because of Almighty God. God has helped me. Uh, it is through God that I survive. Uh, it has threatening my, my faith uh, to become strong because of what I went through. Uh, if you read a book of Job, Job was a very wealthy man, was a well-regarded uh, person. Uh, but then temptation came. You know that um, people w- who are going to listen to, to this, they know that it went through temptation. And Satan came upon him. And, and, um, and, and, and Satan said, you know, God, the reason why Job loved you, because you actually fended him with all stuff with his wealth. If you take away all his wealth right now, he's actually going to rebuke you. It's not going to love you. It's not going to, you know. Anyway, in the Bible, uh, but he was, the Satan was allowed, but not to take his life away. Um, And he was suffering so badly. Things were taken away from him. Himself, physical, uh, like you, my brother Tim. Uh, but he did not give up the love of God, worship with his God, no matter what situation he was in, like you, what you are. And things were taken away from him. Maybe as the way speech is taken away from you, so many things were taken away from you. 
That's what happened to Job. Job. And but Job did not give up. He did not forsake God. He did not abuse God, insult God. He did not move away. He did not backslide. He continued. But you know that from the Bible said, because of that, he was not. Uh, he, he was then spared from that, and came back to be more wealthy than before. But what wealth mean here does not mean money, does not mean having stuff. Wealth mean uh, you, you then now become uh, you know a person that God love, You're becoming uh, a person that have done will of God. So we look at wealth as materials, material things. No, in in in, in other word, is that he never. For say God, he walk, well, you know, he, he continued steadfast and be with God, and God later take him to be with him. That's the wealth that I'm talking about, I guess. And so and that is what to everyone. For me, when I went through all of this, God, uh, we, we, we never forsake God. I shoot grass like a cow, drink human urine so I can stay alive, eat mud buried many of my brothers and my sisters, but I didn't give up. I didn't say, so where is God really? I mean, all these things happened to me. Then there's no God really. I didn't say that. And and uh, and, and, and and I continue to push forward. And uh, and 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 here I am. It, it strengthened me. And th- there is this song that we um um, you know, there is this song, you know, you know, we always say, uh, we, we, we sing the song and then we move. We say, Nyali bandi chowo chajil natye, gam yum de pyo kudar, chong ne de we du ye wot yam ye danda nya, ye danda nya etete woro rich. What did it mean to say, God, please now bless our our journey, bless our journey, and as we go through this wilderness, take fatigue away from us, and be with us on every step, take a fatigue away, take our fatigue away, and let us continue to push forward. We sing that song every single time when we are moving, when, when we are setting, we are on the journey, we will say, Bindi Chowo Chojil Natia. You know, so so we never forsake God through that, through these trials. We know that days like this will happen. Look at what we are doing right now in South Sudan. We are saving more life. When you have donors such as Tim Green, when you have many others that are helping, uh, we 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 are doing the will of God. So it had threatening, uh, it had strengthening my face because of what I went through. So, John, you said that there were two things that kept you alive. One two things. was God. What was the yes. second thing? The second is my culture. Uh, we have a resilient culture. Uh, the, the, the Sudanese sort of a Dinka culture where you don't give up. You don't give up. You keep moving forward. You keep... Uh, uh, pushing on, uh, if you if you show some weakness, my culture. If you show some weakness, people will not respect you. You're not even going to get married too. For example, for those who, uh, as, as we walk, get fatigued, get tired, others say, uh, "I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm just going to, I'm just going to die here." You know what we do? We we sing a song. We compose a song to those people. We said, um, uh, Adipio Jagwala, Kuberao Dalelo. So, what we say is, uh, you greedy one, you can go and die. Tomorrow, we're going to have milk, we're going to have um, uh, sorghum, we're going to have food, we're going to have abundance. You, you the weakest, you the weak one, you can go die. It's okay, you can go die tomorrow. We're going to have this, we're going to have this, we're going to have that. That's why we say, Adipio, Jogola, Kuberao, Dalelo, Adipio, Jogola. 
Then that person would say, no, 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 I'm not the weakest one. They pick himself and then keep going. So we encourage each other. Culturally, we encourage each other to continue to move forward. We don't let, don't, don't let, let, let each other down. If each other is weak, don't let that person down. Continue to be there, push forward. Uh, uh, you know, you know, don't, don't, don't let them give up. You keep pushing. So, so my culture and my belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, those were two pillars. The, the two pillars that helped me to become who I am today. One of the books or movies uh, that was about your story was titled, When God Grew Tired of Us. I can imagine any one of two dozen times when I would have felt that way. But John, you are beyond the definition of perseverance. What was the lowest moment in your story that you were convinced that God had, in fact, grown tired of you? So, yes, there was some couple of times uh, that I would, for example, when, we, when our village was attacked. So that is when that thought came about, say, it was as if God got tired of us. Why did God allow uh, these people here mow us down like grass, killing, looting our cows? We have done nothing wrong to them. So uh, this home on fire, another home on fire, things were completely destruction. So I felt like it was if God got tired of us. So that was one moment. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask that same thing. Was that the hardest moment? The first, the first, that first night, or was there a harder moment? That was the hardest moment. Uh, I never had anything to cushion myself with. I'd never suffered that so badly uh, before that. So that was the first, and that was very difficult. Then, as I move on from another place to another place later, many years, many months, many months, and many years later. Then I have something that I cushion on. I said, what happened to me last year, last year or yesterday? Ah, this one is nothing. And actually, it became the cushion that helped me in the United States. And if something happened to be very difficult in America, ah, I say, listen, I went through things <laughs> you know, harder than this before. But yeah. the first, first day was the difficult, <laughs> was the difficult one. Uh, that was the movement that I felt as if God got tired of us. John, tell us some of the things that surprised you when you first got off the plane. Uh, so when I got off the plane in, in New York City, so I was so surprised when you get out of the, that you see so many kind of pictures of different people, people with head on like these caps on, People with uh, some kind of, uh, you know, different kind of people. <laughs> and I said, so why is it like this? And literally, did I know, I, so America, actually, it's the melting pot right there. I mean, it got me. I said, oh, so all these kind of people that live here in this country? <laughs> you know, they have different religion. You can tell they are sort of different from each other. That was the first time of seeing America is... Uh, you know, America is a, you, you, you know, it's a sanctuary of different kind of people with a different kind of background, with a different kind of religion. That was the first time. That was the first thing. Number two, when we got out of the uh, at JFK there, we we're going to LaGuardia because they're going to, I don't know, well, that was their schedule. From JFK to LaGuardia. And so they put us in a taxi. My friend, the way the cars move, I did not know that actually a human being drive them. <laughs> he was just he going psh, 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 like this. I said, so how, how do they know where they are going? You know, like the road here, like the other one under this, and the one on that. How do they know where they're going? That was what really uh, surprised me. Second, uh, when you buy things in America, it's not the, 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 the price you see on the tech. It's what you're going to pay. You're actually going to pay more than that in Africa. <laughs> is what you see is what you pay. There is something they call tax here in America. So, so and I say, why are they cheating us? Why are they telling us this is what you're going to pay? And actually, 
this is like fifteen dollars. You end up paying seventeen. So I said, why? Why am I America deceiving people? You know, <laughs> that was something uh, that was so surprising. Two uh, third, um, I can see. I mean, there are other things that are you know, maybe not good to say, but. You know, go to a bathroom here in America. It is all open under under it here. I mean, down there. I say, well, this is a private affairs. So why are they making it like public? You know, <laughs> I mean, they, 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 but and now I understand why they're doing that. You know, <laughs> but uh, uh, using a bathroom is is it's, it's a private affairs. It's not a public one. Anyway, I uh, well, you see women driving big buses. Whoa! I said, ah. So these are the ones that are actually carrying gun now, you know, the one that are <laughs> driving buses. I did not know that. Uh, you know, men, men, not, not a lot of men actually drive cars in Africa, let alone women now driving cars. You know, remember South Sudan, we had a male-dominated society. So I grew up like that. So there were so many, many things, Tim, by the team, uh, that surprised me about America. And I did not know. I mean, there are these... Um, uh, you know, uh, before you come to America, they give you orientation, all right? They said, America is like this, call 911 if you have a problem, go to a police, you have NC. And I said, you go to a police? Wow. Because our police there, you really don't need to go to them. <laughs> they will demand something to give to them, pay the money to them, or they will actually do bad thing to you. For example, in Kenyan, uh, Kenyan police, they took my chicken, uh, one day, uh, but um, but they said, if you go to America, if you have any problem, go to a police. Oh, okay. Maybe that, 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 that one is good. So they teach you things like uh, how cold is America. <coughs> so, so this uh, facilitator talk about how America is cold. This guy is actually right now is in, uh, is in Boston. His name is called Sacha Chernobyl. So Sacha was telling us how cold America is. So reach out of the back there, get out, uh, get the, uh, um, get ice, big ice cube, get it, and then place it in my hand. He was so cold. Then I gave it to the other boy, and then another boy, and and he said America is cold like that. And I said, no, this guy's <laughs> actually lying. This guy's lying. I said, the place will be cold like this, and you live now. Nobody can live here. And actually. <laughs> When I came here, it was exactly what it is during winter time. <laughs> it's so cold like that. So those were surprised um, uh, that, that I went through. Can you also tell us about the current state of Sudan? What message do you want to leave our listeners? Lastly, how can they help? Um, the, uh, the state of South Sudan at this point, people, are, so the country just got out of the war. Uh, let, al let alone the war that I was talking about, the war between the North and South. That war was resolved in 20, uh, 2005. <clears throat> but then there was this civil war, South Sudanese, then they start killing themselves. That started in 2013. And it's actually that war is being uh, concluded right now. Uh, America, thanks to United States and UK, Norway, they came in and helped bringing uh, the warring parties together. Now, people in South Sudan have, uh, they are being, being really affected by that war. Uh, they don't have anything uh, to eat because they can't cultivate. Uh, when they start cultivating, then the war, and then the fighting, and then the fighting goes to the village and so on. That has hunted them down. It has been very difficult for everyone in South Sudan uh, to survive. And now people are surviving on United Nations agencies that are supporting them, such as World Food Program and others, including the John Dow Foundation, my organization, that actually, uh, you know, uh, giving, providing health services, for example, med you know, uh, primary health care, which is the, these are basic uh, health care services that we are giving right now. We have 16 facilities right now in South Sudan that John Dow Foundation started. Uh, we have big, one big hospital, 16 other clinic. These are medical clinics that we, uh, ra I raise money here in the U.S. The United Nations, the United, some other United Nations, they supported us, uh, like uh, USAID. USAID helped us as well. And so we, we have been providing health services to mothers who are giving birth, to children being born, vaccinate them, 
help them with you know uh, disease such as uh, malaria, uh, pneumonia, uh, all the other diarrhea, and so on. Those are the primary issues. If you are in the United States, these are issues like issues that you could take to emergency room. All of the above. You feel not well today. You went. You lock into the emergency room. We're lucky to be in the United States. You go to emergency room. You're taken care of by the doctors and uh, and the troop and the sort of army of of nurses and so on. They help you mm-hmm. get you better and then so on. Or sometimes, if you're not really uh, very sick, you go to your doctor, uh, office doctor there, and they take care of you. This is this is combined is what we call the primary health. And that's what we do with the John Duff Foundation now. Uh, and this is services that we give to people, those who cannot even afford anything. <clears throat> Sometimes they come with their chicken. Uh, we say, you know, eat your chicken, but we will take care of you. The Lord have blessed us, and that's why we are able to do this. This is the, the, the generosity of the United States. All the money we get in America, you know, meant to take care of you. So I'm not discouraging them from being self-reliant. But I'm helping those who cannot really help themselves. So those are the things that what we do. And, and we're also doing the maternity work. Um, mother uh, conceived, taking care of them until the baby is born, um, and vaccinate them, and so on. That is part of the work John Duff Foundation do. Now the work that we do, part of it, it's nutrition. People are malnourished. Like I said before, they don't cultivate because of war here and there, tribe fighting another tribe. And so there's no way they can get a time to cultivate and grow food. And so John Duff Foundation will come in and help those who are malnourished. For example, we have come have to come bring them together like every Friday, and we do what we call uh, nutrition screening. So we screen them. We give, we bring a tape. Tape is marked with yellow, red, and green. So you put it at the upper arm of the baby, and then if it's red, if it is if it's red, uh, red. Then that child is malnourished. We're gonna we're gonna admit them and give them food, give them milk, give them what is called plump nuts. Uh, a plump nut is like uh, peanut butter, milk, and egg combined, combined together by the by the World Health Organization, the WHO, and give it to us and the UNICEF as well. Give it to us so that we can administer to these children. So we can ad- admit over fifty children and then feed them. For two weeks, they gain weight. We are release them. Now the batch come in. We feed them. We release them like that. Or mothers who are malnourished. You know, children, uh, women are there. Are the one getting the brunt of, of 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 the of the situation that we have there because mothers are the one they cook. They do all of this kind of thing. Small food and give it to everyone. Almost, she's not gonna get enough. And if she's mm-hmm. not getting enough every day, she's getting thinner and thinner and thinner and she's pregnant and and that mm. she, she's not uh, one person now two people so what we do we round them up those pregnant mothers that are very skinny uh, very emaciated we give them food give them what we call plump some it's another kind of food that can uh, you know feed her, feed her or the mother that lactating the baby is breastfeeding so we also give them Plump, plump some so that she can gain weight and as she gain weight she can produce more milk to the child and that is that's the, the, the treatment that we are doing right now that is uh, and then we also help younger younger mothers uh, how to feed their babies and we also help people how to grow crops how to grow their little crop around their home so then they can use it as part of, of diet as well you know so that they can Okay, can help themselves. So these are the things, give them education and so on. That is the second one. The third one is also we help them what we call watch, uh, you know, sanitation, um, hygiene and, and sanitation. And so mm-hmm. we give them some supply, especially those young girls uh, need uh, hygiene stuff, give them to them, uh, supply to them all the time because they cannot afford anything. So we do that. And also we, we drill what a well. And uh, so that there is clean water. Uh, having clean water, drink clean water, use clean water, also help with the disease as well. Because they're, they're not drinking dirty water, they're giving them disease and they come back to us. 
Those are the things that we do. That is the third program, the health, nutrition, and hygiene. Another program that we are venturing into right now is what we call gender-based violence. The gender-based violence, um, you know, to, to help, uh, help young men understand women are also, they have right too. So you treat them this way, in that way, in that way. So those are the things that we do, the gender-based violence. That's what we are working on now. We're working on all this kind of thing, you know, such as uh, uh, education as well. That is the work of the John Duff Foundation. If you look at you listen to the last part of my, uh, my story where life was terrible for me, uh, you know, somebody was actually working hard here in America, maybe in Europe or somewhere else, raise money so that I can have food in the camp, so that I can have, uh, you know, uh, clothes, so that I can have medicine, so that I can have all the things that I need at the time, at that time when I was completely no, no power. Now I, I am in a position of power. What gave, me, what gave me power is being in the United States. That's my power. And so, so to be talking to very generous people like Tim Green and others, uh, uh, to bring the message to them. And that it's been in the power. It's my turn. And that dictated by the love of God. For me, there is nothing in front of God that is so important than to help other person. And that is, what, that is the business I am in now, to continue to help until I die. You know, so John, yeah, that's all, all that is, is beautiful. What could somebody do if somebody has money and they want to donate, where should they go? And number two, if somebody doesn't have money, is there something they could do to help? If you have some money, you can donate it to the John Duff Foundation. You go www.johndufffoundation.com. That's awesome. when you can do it there online. Or if you wanted to write a check, you can write it to another, our organization called South Sudan Nation Builders. South Sudan Nation Builders will be able to cut your check and then you can designate it to whatever you want. Let's say this money is going to be used for uh, blood transfusion or blood bank or is going to food, is going to what? Designate your, your donation. We will uh, going to do the same thing. If you don't have uh, money, uh, there are so many things you can do. Share our John Duff Foundation story so then the one we have now, right now, you go to the John Duff Foundation and then share our uh, uh, you know, website there to the people that you know. Another thing you can do, talk about us. Another thing you do also, if you are a doctor, a nurse or something, and you want to volunteer, you let us know. We can make that happen. And then you can go there, do your one week, uh, do your two days, do your whatever it is. We can, uh, you can get the message out like that. John Dow, as always, my brother, it has been both a pleasure and honor to speak with you. Troy and I are going to kick off what we hope will be a state of contributions with a check for $10,000 because the best kind of giving is where the people who benefit can never thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you, my brother. My brother, Tim. And you too, little brother Troy, thank you so very much. I, I, I really appreciate you uh, for your support. Tim, you've been supporting us nonstop. And the situation you are in and you're actually helping other people. That is, um, that is, that, that is unbelievable. Thank you so much for your support, getting my message out. And you've been doing this, been supporting us since we started. And since I know you from our church, may the Lord God uh, use you as the way he used Job. Uh, you go through that, go through the situation you are in, um, but the Lord is with you. You are another Job. Thank you so much. Uh, with your younger son, uh, Troy, um, who has a lot, a lot of years ahead and then you start doing the right thing at this younger age Troy you're the best thank you so <laughs> much and I appreciate you John thanks so much for coming on you're you're an unbelievable story and an even better person so thank you so much for the time 
And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and bless your family. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.